Hello, friends. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing very well. I wanted to uh, just share some of my favorite poetry. I've been enjoying these. I have one of my favorites is Gary Snyder's Rip Rap and Cold Mountain Poems, fifth, 50th anniversary edition. Beautiful, um, or woodblock print on the cover, really beautiful. Gary's an old hippie <laughs> who kept at it from the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, I haven't ever seen him live, but I do, I do enjoy his poetry, and I do enjoy his translations. So this uh, 50th anniversary, originally published in 1958, I like the format. It's a very small, thin book, as a good book of poetry should be. He's got rip-rap poems I'm going to come back to, but I'm going to start with a cold mountain poem. Born 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I was born into the world. A thousand, ten thousand miles I've roamed. By rivers where the green grass grows thick, beyond the border where the red sands fly, I brewed potions in a vain search for everlasting life. I read books, I sang songs of history, and today I've come home to Cold Mountain to pillow my head on the stream and wash my ears. A bug trapped in a bowl, encircled by peak on peak of life's dust. Man is a bug trapped in a bowl, all day skittering up its sides, ever falling back, never bounding out. His imagined joys always beyond his reach, his present miseries ever close by, till eventually his little river of years dries up. And old age takes teeth, takes hair, takes all. Climbing up the cold mountain. Clamoring up the cold mountain path, the cold mountain trail goes on and on. The long gorge choked with scree and boulders. The wide creek. The mist-blurred grass. The moss is slippery, though there's been no rain. The pine sings, but there's no wind. Who can leap the world's ties and sit with me among the white clouds? This is a preface to the poems of Han Shan by Lu Chiu Yen, governor of Tai Prefecture. And the beginning blurb here is uh, from Gary in italics. Kanzan or Han Shan, Cold Mountain, takes his name from where he lived. He is a mountain madman in an old Chinese line of ragged hermits. When he talks about Cold Mountain, he means himself, his home, his state of mind. He lived in the Tang Dynasty, traditionally AD 627 to 650, although Hu Shi dates him 700 to 780. This makes him roughly contemporary with Tu Fu, Li Po, Wang Wei, and Po Chui. His poems, of which 300 survive, are written in Tang colloquial, rough and fresh. The ideas are Taoist, Buddhist, and Zen, and his sidekick, Shite, Chitoku in Japanese, became great favorites with Zen painters of later days. The scroll, the broom, the wild hair, and laughter, they became immortals, and you sometimes run into them today in the shadows, the orchards, the hobo jungles, and logging camps of America. So Gary Snyder, you know, he, he was definitely, I think he spent a lot of time on the road wandering, and, uh, and he saw Cold Mountain all over the place, wherever he went. Simplicity. When I came across Han Shan's poems, I was astounded. I was just, I, I read uh, Red Pine, uh, who is, an, um, I believe, an American gentleman, um, taking the name Red Pine, translated um, Han Shan's poems. And I, I read his poems first, and I really thought they were beautiful. And they struck me how simple and how profound they were. The other interesting thing about Han Shan is he wrote a lot of his poems on the walls of the mountain and caves and and that's basically what survived and and then we have this uh, preface that i'm about to read um from from uh lu chiu yin the governor about his experience at the same time trying to find trying to to find han shan so i find it fascinating to just read the account of somebody kind of engaging with him personally yeah i often come back to his poetry because it just keeps things clear and crisp and simple as life can be. And, and I see a lot of beautiful wisdom and crazy wisdom in his words. And I can almost see him saying or thinking these things as he's writing them. And, 
And uh, so, yeah, they're very energetic for me and, um, and very, um, very beautiful, I think, generally. So, continuing on now to the preface. No one knows just what sort of man Han Shan was. There are old people who knew him. They say he was a poor man, a crazy character. He lived alone 70 li west of the Tang Sing district of Tiantai at a place called Cold Mountain. Forgive my terrible Chinese pronunciation. He often went down to the Kuching Temple. At the temple lived Shi Te, who ran the dining hall. He sometimes saved leftovers for Han Shan, hiding them in a bamboo tube. Han Shan would come and carry it away, walking the long veranda, calling and shouting happily, talking and laughing to himself. Once the monks followed him, caught him, and made fun of him. He stopped, clapped his hands, and he laughed greatly. <laughs> for a spell, then he left. Just a personal aside there. I read uh, a recent article that said... Now, I haven't, I haven't researched this uh, exhaustively, so take this with a grain of salt. But the article um, spoke of the two things, two common most reported things that people say on their deathbed. One, I wish I had been more myself. Translated to, I wish I would have been more my authentic self. And two, I wish I had the courage to be honest about what I feel and express my emotions. Speaking up and sharing your heart is uh, very difficult for sure. If you're trying to think your way through it. But when you're in the flow and your heart is flowing and your mind is calm and quiet, it can be very beautiful. I'm astonished at sometimes what will flow out of me when I'm in that space. It's a real challenge to get to that space and calm yourself down. These days, I don't really, I'm not really sharing anything until I really feel like I'm in a state of mind or, or have a particular thing itching in the back of my brain or in the bottom of my heart or middle of my heart <laughs> that I want to, that I want to say something. I made it really convenient. I have many, many recordings that I just, you know, are for myself that I index and, sh and save on my... It's an exploration. It's a way to surface what's under the surface. <laughs> and that's really what the heart of the work is. You're surfacing what's hidden. I've put out a few videos, just my own personal meditations, but... I, I am inviting some interaction by putting them on YouTube. And I have to say, I've been pretty surprised by the result. Most folks don't listen to all your video <laughs> until I think you really get a solid group of people listening to you that are interested. It's not important. It's just something that I noticed. And uh, I've, I've heard other content creators talking about. I'm not creating content for clicks or likes or advertising dollars. I'm just sharing the view and I'm having a lot of fun and I'm going to, and I share my honest, I feel like it's important to share from my weakness and my struggles as well. When everybody is trying to prop up their identity and you could say, oh, he's just trying to be, you know, just false humility. He's trying to to appear a certain way. Well, no, that's not true in this case. These are genuine expressions and genuine snapshots of time from, from an average person's life. Most life is pretty quiet most of the time, punctuated by extremely loud crashes and sometimes gentle wind. And, uh, you know, life's lived in between. So I think it's, if you're going to express yourself publicly, I think to me, I want to have, I want to be authentic and I want to have integrity and I want to share the journey, the real journey from the inside. And it's funny because it's evoked some reactions from some folks. I've just published 
four videos so far. And uh, I had done a lot of other art that was, again, just for my own edification, really, and fun. And, um, and I think it's, you should be playful. I mean, I think the best state of mind to be in, if you're going to talk about yourself is, is from a playful place. It can get intense at times for sure. We can't always, we're not always happy and we're not always laughing, but, uh, I try to as much as I can for sure. And, uh, and, and this last line, well, it's interesting because the reaction it provoke it invokes in others i mean what a lot of times i don't think they realize and i learned this myself by by engaging with others is that a lot of times our reactions are really about us <laughs> they're about they're a mirror for that's held up to us and where i've been vulnerable sometimes i'll get comments or somebody will message me and say hey don't worry about it it's okay buck up <laughs> well thank you I appreciate your comments, but I'm not looking for an answer per se. I'm really just kind of sharing, you know, sharing the movement, sharing what's moving and flowing at that moment. Not that there's anything particularly profound or that you would find any interest or edification in my words. I'm still, I'm adding my voice to the wind in a time of a lot of social and political chaos. And these are the things that bring peace to me. And I do try to stay, or not stay, but I do try to find a peaceful place to kind of exist in with so much out there. The thing you can control is what comes into your mind and, and what you listen to and see. So others have, I don't want to call them trolls, but they'll come into my space where, you know, if anything, I'm inviting them to be personal and to share their experience. Because that really is what the work's about. The work is not some system <laughs> of check, 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 one, two, three, and, and this is your result. Not at all. It's just, it's just the journey. It's just living your life in a world that's moving so fast, I'm dizzy. But some have kind of come in and stomped around and vomited their technical jargon about this or that topic that I may mention. And that's really not the level I really want to engage on. I don't need their reinterpretation or nor am I looking for their reinterpretation of, of, of the moment. I'm inviting them to a conversation if they, if they want to have one. And if not, so be it. So um, I've had to do a little bit of editing in my channel um, to clean up some messes, some vomit that some of the folks stopped by to say, um, and left, <laughs> but, uh, but I would invite people who would comment, be respectful, be personal and share from your experience. If you, if you'd like to engage here, because, um, that's, uh, and I appreciate your knowledge and your, and, and what you may have, to, you know, I'm not judging per se what you may have to say, but I'm, I'm inviting a, com a conversation. And if, if you have nothing to say, then don't say anything. That's great. If you do, just be respectful and read the room. I mean, I, I was really astounded by the nastiness of some people, especially if you challenge them and simply say, hey, I appreciate that, but I, I don't like, you know, I mean, if you could, you're just sharing, you know, way off context and could you bring it back to center? And that will invoke sometimes an immediate reaction. Um, negative reaction. Mm. But anybody with a chip on their shoulder saying, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to set this guy straight or, or this guy is ignorant or, or he doesn't know. And <laughs> those are, those are, those are reflections of yourself. Those are words about yourself to yourself and they're projecting. I certainly have shared opinions about others and the words of others and the responses that I've had um, over my time online. And, and I definitely have come to a place where I'm trying to, you know, I don't share those as much. And when I do, I realize I'm talking about myself a lot of times, no, you know, 99% of the time I'm really sharing, I think kind of the filter through, you know, obviously through my own experience. And, um, and I try to keep it personal generally if I do share now and I try to keep it relevant, but sometimes I may be playful. Sometimes I may be, um, obstinate, you know, and sometimes, um, but generally in my comments online, I'm, I mean, well, 
So this last line, he stopped. The monks were making fun of him. He stopped, he clapped his hands, and he laughed greatly. And this is something that I, 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 I really have done. Just kind of seeing these responses. I mean, my general, my general reaction is, is one of humor and, and fun, and I want to play with them. Especially if they're off topic, I, I try to play with them and, and I'm not trying to frustrate them. But when you know, if you're coming from yourself and you're being genuine, if others would tear you down or, or tease you or, or whatever, you know, take it in a good spirit, see the best and uh, turn the other cheek. <laughs> if one would throw stones, take the stones, don't throw them back. I generally don't like to respond immediately. I, I try to sit with it a little bit and reflect a little bit before I say something. Uh, that's not always true. Sometimes I'm very off the cuff and, and, uh, and I miss the mark often. But I think it's important not to throw when, when it does get to name calling and, 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 and thrones and stone throwing. Um, I, I, I'm, pra- I'm trying to practice not throwing the, that stone, picking that stone up and throwing it back. So that's interesting. I didn't really think about th- this kind of thing when I was starting to, to do this little project. And uh, so that's something I'm definitely learning about myself and about people. But I can really relate to Han Shan here laughing. And uh, I'm going to remind myself, you know, I'm not, you know, best to best silence is usually the best response, especially if somebody is off balance and coming at you with some intent to the non sequitur attack or if somebody's attacking you, that's generally the best thing to do. I'm just picking at my mat and moving on from folks that I can't really have conversations with. I think it's important to to limit the toxicity you let into yourself, especially when it's, you know, somebody else's issues oozing all over you, there's a limit. I mean, we're human beings. We can only take so much of that kind of negativity. Take what sticks and leave the rest. <laughs> so uh, anyway, ha ha, <laughs> um, as Han Shan so, uh, said so wisely. Okay, continuing page 35 of Rip Rap by Gary Snyder. He looked like a tramp. His body and face were old and bare, yet in every word he breathed was a meaning in line with the subtle principles of things. If only you thought of it deeply. Everything he said had a feeling of the Tao in it, profound and arcane secrets. His hat was made of birch bark, his clothes were ragged and worn, and his shoes were wood. Thus men who have made it hide their tracks, unifying categories and interpenetrating things. On that long veranda, calling and singing, in his words of reply, ha ha, the three worlds revolve. Sometimes at the villages and farms he laughed and sang with cowherds, sometimes intractable, sometimes agreeable. His nature was happy of itself. But how could a person without wisdom recognize him? I once received a position as a petty official in Tain Chi in Chiu. The day I was to depart, I had a bad headache. I called a doctor, but he couldn't cure me, and it got worse. Then I met a Buddhist master named Feng Khan, who said he came from the Kuching Temple of Ten Tai, especially to visit me. I asked him to rescue me from my illness, and he smiled and said, The four realms are within the body. Sickness comes from illusion. If you want to do away with it, you need pure water. Someone brought water to the master, who spat it on me. In a moment, the disease was rooted out. He then said, There are miasmas in Thai prefecture. When you get there, take care of yourself. I asked him, are there any wise men in your area that I could look on as a master? He replied, when you see him, you don't recognize him. When you recognize him, you don't see him. If you want to see him, you can't rely on appearances. Then you can see him. Han Shan is a Mansuri hiding in Kuching. Shite is a Samantabhadra. They look like poor fellows and act like madmen. Sometimes they go and sometimes they come. They work in the kitchen of the Kuching dining hall, tending the fire. When he was done talking, he left. I proceeded on my journey to my job in Tao Cho, not forgetting this affair. I arrived three days later, immediately went to the temple and questioned an old monk. It seemed the master had been truthful, so I gave orders to see if Tang Sing really contained a Han Shan and Chi Te. The district magistrate reported to me. In this district, 70 Li West, is a mountain. People used to see a poor man heading from the cliffs to stay while the, a while at Kuching. 
At the temple dining hall is a similar man named Shite. I made a bow and I went to Kuching. I asked some people around the temple. There used to be a master named Feng Khan here. Where is this place? And where can Han Shan and Shite be seen? A monk named Dao Chiao spoke up. Feng Khan, the master, lived in back of the library. Nowadays, nobody lives there. A tiger often comes and roars. Han Shan and Shite are in the kitchen. The monk led me to Feng Khan's yard. Then he opened the gate. All we saw was tiger tracks. I asked the monks, Tao Chiyo and Pao Te, when Feng Khan was here, what was his job? The monk said he pounded and hulled rice. At night, he sang songs to amuse himself. Then we went to the kitchen before the stoves. Two men were facing the fire, laughing loudly. I made a bow. The two shouted, Ho! at me. They struck their hands together. Ha ha! Great laughter, they shouted. Then they said, Feng Khan, loose-tongued, loose-tongued. You don't recognize Amatba. Why be courteous to us? The monks gathered round, surprise going through them. Why is a big official bowed to a pair of clowns? The two men grabbed hands and ran out of the temple. I cried, catch them, but they quickly ran away. Hanshan returned to Cold Mountain. I asked the monks, would those two men be willing to settle down at his temple? I ordered them to find a house and to ask Hanshan and Chite to return and live in the temple. I returned to my district and I had two sets of clean clothes made, got some incense and such, and sent it to the temple. But the two men didn't return, so I had it carried up to Cold Mountain. The packer saw Han Shan, who called in a loud voice, Thief! Thief! and retreated into a mountain cave. He shouted, I tell you, man, strive hard, entered the cave, and was gone. <laughs> I love that crazy book. He's funny. The cave closed of itself, and they weren't able to follow. Shite's tracks disappeared completely. I ordered Tao Chi Chiyo and the other monks to find out how they had lived, to hunt up the poems written on bamboo, wood, stones, and cliffs, and also to collect those written on the walls of people's houses. There were more than 300. On the wall of the earth shrine, Shite had written some, some gatha. It was all brought together and made into a book. I told, I hold to the principle of the Buddha mind. It is fortunate to meet with men of Tao. So I have made this eulogy. <sighs> so um, the men of Tao, to meet men of Tao. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Westerner. Um, I'm not uh, particularly well. I don't know much about Eastern cultures except what I've read. I haven't lived in with Asian people or... Or lived in the way, or t or taken up the way of life that that they live, and uh, so this is very, this is like a strange food for me when I first came across the Tao and Zen and and looking into Taoism and Buddhism, and uh, I I did not um, I I didn't go deeply, very deeply into Buddhism. Um, I really just, <laughs> honestly, all of the writings and, and, and precepts and different things, I mean, that have evolved over many, many, many ages, um, it just put me off and, but I, but I was drawn to this, to some of this, the simple people, the men of Tao that I found. Wherefore, I really, I think understood what men of Tao is, and I don't pretend to fully understand it now because, you know, the Tao, what is the Tao? What would hum what do humans say about the Tao? So Han Shan shared I'll take his word over anybody else's I've come across. He uh I mean the essence of his writing distills his experience of the Tao. I don't want to say his knowledge, but his experience of the Tao. He learned these things through hard work and hard living. He did his work. <laughs> he, um, if you look into his biography, what little's known, it's, it's interesting. He was a, he was an official in the government and became disillusioned and, uh, you know, went off to the mountains to find himself. And, uh, I think he did. I think of all the people I've come across in my studies, 
Han Shan to me reflects the most clear, has the most, has the clearest voice. They hit, his words hit me right between the eyes more so than others. He's not trying to put on any airs. He's not trying to be, he was obviously uh, an educated person, but that wasn't the essence of, of who he was. He was able to distill the, I think his essence down. And I think it's important to think about or understand a little bit about what the essence of the Tao is, T-A-O. It's not something to be grasped through intellect or ambition. You harmonize with it. You merge into it. It's like a river. Always, it's the always flowing river. It does take humility and detachment and more than anything, silence and stillness, um, which are obviously in short supply within our current upside down world. This is something that really does attract me to the lifestyle of a, of a crazy hermit. I think, I think I'm on, I think I'm heading towards a hermitage. I've kind of made my home this year, kind of a hermitage in a way. I've, uh, I'm on a hiatus or a sabbatical from work this year, taking care of some personal things and, and taking the opportunity to also relax, um, spend time with my wife that was sorely needed. And, uh, luckily the last five years, I've been able to spend a lot of time with my dogs and my wife. I have no children. And so we kind of live a very simple hermetic <laughs> life and our home is sacred and we are one another's best friend. And we also see all the warts and ugliness of each other up close as well. You can't hide that. And the rough edges rub, <laughs> create a lot of friction. Um, but there's a b subtle beauty to our flow, I think we've come to in a relationship and sure there's, there's turbulent water and turbulent times and I may share some of that turbulence, but this is the, this is where I am. I'm, I'm deeply involved in this relationship with a human being and they are deeply involved with me. And we don't still, after 10 years, we're just about to have our 10 year anniversary, anniversary of meeting. We've been married about six years. I'm still just now, I'm 52 and she's uh, a little, she's younger than I am. And I'm just now getting to the point of, you know, realizing that there are some very, there's some hot spots that we've been dealing with. Um, and, uh, and that's a good thing. It's, it's a good thing. It's worth, it's worth being known. It's worth investing in, in a relationship, I believe. So you know, Han Shan, in one sense, he's a hermetic hobo. <laughs> he's a crazy man in the woods. But I also, you know, my, my, my path is, you know, making this way with, with another human being. And I think it gives another dimension. I mean, I believe he was married and she had children and had kind of left as the way, as, as the way it was back then, he kind of left that behind and something doesn't really sit with me very well. That doesn't sit with me very well. Although I understand the desire to sometimes one struggle that I think I'm, I'm having right now with my wife is um, taking time and, and having carving out my own space. And I was, uh, I need that. I need time to process things. I, in the moment when there is a flash of anger or some argument, you know, I, I really, I'm the kind of person that needs I need to take a step back and I need things to cool down before I can think clearly. And, uh, you know, that's not always true of my wife. She's, she's a hard charger and, uh, just, you know, won't let go. And until I have to, you know, erupt like a volcano, it feels like, you know, to, and with great heat to get the space that I need. And that's something uh, I'm working on for sure, because, you know, I'm trying to be more gentle and, and more patient and hum more humble. And not having, but I am insistent that I do need, you know, there's a best, there's a better way to deal with, to deal with me. And, and we're still struggling through that for sure. 
but I, I anyway, so there you go. I mean, that's the Dow. <laughs> um, you know, we're living our life together and, and we're, uh, and my, you know, the, my deepest desire is for peace, um, as much as possible. But until I have that myself in hand, well in hand, it's, you know, I can't really show that to somebody else, um, very well beyond my natural current state, which has plenty of rough edges. So with that said, um, for Hanshan, the Tao reveals itself in nature's flow and quiet majesty, in the mountains, clouds, streams, and mist. The Tao is not something one can manipulate, but something that envelops all things. The way of the Tao is a mountain path, he said, twisting, turning through clouds and fog, climbing higher, you find no end. The wind whispers, the stream replies. Hmm. The natural world in its uncontrived simplicity serves as the clearest mirror of the Tao. Another quote from Hanshan about it. I fled to Cold Mountain. I left the human crowd. A thousand paths twist and turn, but none lead away from the way. You know, so there's, I think the Western view is that, oh, you know, um, it's all meditating and quiet. And that's how you really, you know, are in the still, stillness and reflection. No, these two guys are in the kitchen laughing. The Tao is, is just living your life by the fire, eating your food. Relieving yourself. I mean, that's really where the Tao is. The Tao is all around us all the time. And it's such a put on the way that the that Westerners describe it and see it, I think. It's such a, there's, there's just a falseness to it. I mean, the Tao was, I mean, these guys were just, they were crazy. They were just living their lives. And, um, you know, but he said something interesting there. I fled to Cold Mountain. I think that's how a lot of us come to Cold Mountain. Remember, that's just our inner state that he found. And uh, we flee to it. But more and more, I think the place that I would flee to is not some place that, that is free of all commotion and total silence and no thought. It's being able to see in a moment the beauty and, and, and reality, cold, rea hard reality of what is happening and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and being, and being aware of your reactions and your thoughts and you're just, you're flowing with it, but you're also one foot away from it in the sense that you are, you're, you have a little gap, a little space where, you know, when something happens, you have a little, a little lead time, a little bit of time to react. And, and for me, that little space, that's the, that's the thing. That's the key. That's the trick. So um, anyway, in that way, it's effortless. It's not something to achieve or somewhere to go, or you have to go find some master in a, in a mount, on a mountain. There's plenty. If you look on, if you look on the, uh, on YouTube, there's lots of content creators that have gone you know, literally to the source, uh, to the, to the strangest place they could find to look for themselves. And they, they have a common story when they come back or even this crazy monk I've been listening to just for fun. And they have a common story, you know, like, no, this is lived. You carry this with you. It doesn't matter where you are. Cold mountain is, is inside of you. And the Tao is you're flowing in the Tao, And, and it's not all, uh, it's not all butterflies and fairy tales. It's, uh, it's uh stark it's cold it's rainy it's wet it's uh it's warm it's it's a good meal it's laughing with a friend it's having a beer with somebody or a drink with somebody and and just being yourself and being real and uh so i think this is common this is common experience you know we tend to we tend to idolize i think what we don't understand the dao operates through wu wei uh, this, this is a great, I, 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 when I came across this concept like years ago, I was just, oh, it just, it felt like a duck to water. So the Tao operate, operates through Wu Wei or effortless action. Han Shan mocked human striving and ambition, viewing them as barriers to understanding the Tao. See, I don't agree. I don't agree exactly. They're just a means, but the barrier, you know, the barrier is the way, you know, the hindrance, the, the obstacle is the way that's a, that's a great, uh. That's a great Stoic concept from 
from uh, from Roman uh, era, the the obstacle is the way. The why here's a quote from Han Shan: The wise know the path is no path. No need to force the current of the stream. Fools rush and stumble while the water flows on its own. And that's it. Does the water flows on its own? Effortless action. Doing, not doing. I love that definition of way, way, way. Doing, not doing. To Han Shan, the Tao unfolds naturally, and any attempt to control or grasp it leads only to confusion. Oh my God, is that the not the case? Confusion upon confusion, upon confusion to to seal off the water, to to try to create your own cistern of the water to to try to hold on to it or grasp it 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 just it you you will never control it so you immediately are shown and taught by nature reflecting on nature the folly of human control and power that's the first thing that goes <laughs> when you really dunk yourself in it and forget yourself but as um but again, I mean, and, and you bring this back to your personal life. I mean, this is, uh, hmm. it's very strange when you first let these ideas and they're not, and they're not ideas, but when you start to walk out on these, walk this out and, and practice, not practice, but live, 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 live with awareness, live with awareness. When you do that to see the beauty of it and the simplicity of it and to see how nature shows us so much, I think how to be and, and and yeah like i said it, it's not all uh it's not always warm you know it's it's often very difficult and there's a lot of suffering and pain and fear that goes along with it and these things uh keep us alive you know these things keep us on our toes for sure so whatever happens you may not be very good at your first reactions but that's something you can work on for sure um and improve it certain you certainly can't improve that but um it's really just learning to 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 live with awareness. I think is really the, the the basic you know the basic truth of it. So, but that said, there is something mysterious here too, very mysterious. So Hanshan often emphasized the ineffable and paradoxical nature of the Tao. It cannot be named or defined, only experienced. Right. This is also uh, a very profound way to see the world i think and very par paradoxical to our western way of being taking the bull by the horn raising up our will as the prime idolizing our will and our personality and living ruggedly and uh tough being a tough person you know at least that's the male view the the which i think is just so often just uh, just look at the confusion everywhere today Everyone, they're not hiding it anymore. It's it's out in the open. So it's actually beautiful to see. And to that's the Tao too. <laughs> Confusion is is uh is an is a common companion in our lives. And not to be looked down upon and not to be spurned. Confusion should be embraced. And I think also you should be thankful for your confusion. So and I can be and am often very confused. So I can, I can, uh, <laughs> I can, I can, uh, I can say this from experience as we all can. Um, so this is another quote from Han Shan. The way is vast beyond measure or form. Words try to catch it, but fail. Sit quietly. Let your heart be still. The mountain is silent, but the Tao is clear. Hmm. If you've ever gone hiking or you've ever come across a lake, in a pristine area, maybe with mountains or trees or some, and you just sit there by the water. I'm there right now, looking at, looking at it in my mind, in my heart. Beautiful white capped mountains in the distance, lush forest all around, perfectly still water. And what do you see come up to the still water? You see, you see animals coming and going. You see things living and dying. But here you are sitting by the still water and sitting with things. This is the, this is the, 
as far as the work goes, sitting with things before you react is really, I think, the fruit of this endeavor, one fruit of the work that you can enjoy as you go. And I think uh, you need to enjoy those times of silence, those times of peace that, are, that punctuate the rest of the, the utter chaos at times. <laughs> but this is, I think, the challenge with, with this uh, way of thinking and living. You can live that out in your life. You can find that, that stillness. And I think there's a lot of power there. That's really where our power is and, and being ready to act w without needing to act or jumping out of the way of that boulder as it comes careening down, you know, that you might not have seen any, unless you were, you know, unless your eyes were straight, looking straight ahead and you were walking straight forward. So for Han Shan, the Tao is like a mist, the veil. It's like the misty veil on the mountains. It's there. It surrounds everything. It brings moisture. It's, it's the essence of things, but it's, it's really, do you understand the mist? <laughs> do you need to? No, you don't. The mist is the mist. So um, finally, uh, Han Shan viewed the Tao as freedom from the illusions and the attachments of life. By aligning with the Tao, one can transcend their suffering and find peace. I don't know about all that, but <laughs> no, I can say, I mean, I've tested this a lot in my life. I don't think you transcend anything ever. You integrate. Instead of there being, you know, round, square peg, round hole, you, you know, you wear the edges down until the peg fits in the hole. And you whittle away, you whittle away, you whittle away. You're always, you're always carving yourself up and, and sanding and, you know, it's, it's like, uh, I mean, my hope by the end of my life could be tomorrow, could be in a minute, could be in a second, but my hope, and it's not a hope, I mean, but I see a, a wooden scene carved out of my life that just captures the moments or essences, the essence of it. And, and, uh, Living in balance is definitely, especially somebody like myself, finding calmness in that peace is, uh, it's beyond understanding. It's, it, as much as everything is, you know, in flux, there's also this unchanging stillness in the midst of it that you become aware of and you start to perceive and you long, you don't long for it, but you return to it. You come back and return to that place whenever things are still or things the the chaos or the, 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 the disturbance has passed. And I think there's a lot of wisdom there to see and live in that, that place and not desire and sacrifice and, you know, and, and hurt your life to, to get there. Cause you can't do that. That's not the way it's a waterway. It's learning to deal with life and flow with life. Like the way water flows through, through a mountain, down a mountain. So, uh, this is, um, Han Shan. I laugh at the world, clinging to dust and gold. The Tao gives freely. Why chase what, what fades? Rest your heart where rivers meet the sky, and you'll find cold mountain. Rest your heart where rivers meet the sky. That's a beautiful line, by the way. Rest your heart where rivers meet the sky, and you'll find cold mountain. You'll realize the mist will clear. It, you will walk out of confusion into crisp clarity. Not even aware that such a thing was possible before. And then you, you gasp <gasps> like what, you know, you don't even know what happened. And then you're in cold on cold mountain. You're right there. <laughs> uh, the Tao to Han Shan is liberation from the mind's turmoil found in surrendering to the flow of existence. True. A very beautiful, very real. Surrender. In the work, surrendering is a requirement. When we are, when we come at things defending our position, defending our personalities and identities, that is not surrendering to the flow of existence. 
it seems passive and weak. You know, if you, if you, you know, in our bro culture, that's, that reflects, in my opinion, a, a psychosis, a, 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 a literally mental illness being projected outward and misunderstanding of, of life being projected outward. Confusion. Bro culture, as an example to me, is an expression of confusion, not peace, not strength, but weakness. Fear, anger. I just, oh, I feel it so. Oh, every time I, I, you know, now I, 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 I really don't take in a lot of the current news and I don't take in the, the flow of confusion. I look for the still points, the still places. That's where the world turns. You can notice it, but only if you're still and only if you're quiet. And, and only, only then do you get a perception of where the flow is and how it's, and how it's moving. So finally, you know, Han Shan's view, and I think this is a good kind of summary for his life. That I mean, the Tao is not something to be achieved. It's a way of being. Uh, an attunement to the simple, the quiet, the eternal, much like the mountains and the streams he called home. So we don't understand what eternity is. If whatever it is we speak, there's that word eternity. People don't want to end. People want their experience to continue. And I think that's the perspective of an ego and a personality. It's natural. It's not a bad thing. It's, it keeps them alive. It keeps them functioning, keeps them moving forward. But, and I've experimented a lot with this, letting things form and shape, letting things, you know, I passively, you know, the last 10 years, in the last 10 years, I have never sent a resume to anybody that didn't ask for one in my professional life. I have never said, oh, I want that job. I'm going to go after it. And it's been a very interesting, it's the water has taken me to very interesting places and, and meandered around some very strange obstacles. And, and it's, um, it's, it's one way that I tried, that I've tried to practice in my normal life some of these ideas and concepts and uh it's not for everybody but i've taken that general approach these days to things and letting things flow and not making things happen and uh and i have i found a lot more peace i i have to i have to say and that's a fruit of the work for sure i think the good work good work yields good fruit and there's nothing like sinking your teeth into that luscious sweet juicy peach <laughs> that that you've come across that that's grown on your tree on a tree and just enjoying that fruit you know that in and of itself right there now sometimes the tree burns down sometimes lightning hits the tree and it burns and that's fruit too that's just what happens that's the way that's the way so i mean they're they're i mean in 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 the tang period i mean that's actually the best i think one of the better or more pure, clear uh, times relating to Zen teachers who, whose thoughts and words were written down and lives were captured. We have a lot of stories from there. It's funny, there's, as Westerners will do, they've co op there's a group on Reddit, there's a Zen group slash Zen, that um, it's a very strange place. It's like the Western mind trying to grasp these, this, this whole entirely different approach, you know, to life. And you find all sorts, I wrote, I, I used to write there a long time ago, and I had all sorts of fun, uh, crazy antics with people and just went around and around and around in circles. And the, doing this kind of thing online, not connected to people, I think is, that's the unfortunate reality of our world. And the, you know, that's how a lot of people relate now. So what you see, you can see a lot of their, you know, the ugliness, the, no, the normal guards that we have up are not in place. And you see people really thrashing and, and making a mess. And then you see others gently flowing along. <laughs> and one is more desirable to me than the other. And I want to know how best to end the thrashing does occur. And, and, uh, but if you see the, what happens there, it's, it's an interesting little microcosm of, 
kind of how our brains, our Western brains kind of deal with this, this foreign, not foreign, but this, uh, this alternative view of, of how to live. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting. You know, I don't, I don't write there anymore and I don't even read there anymore. I mean, I'm in, I found cold mountain. I mean, I really want to leave it. <laughs> it's exhausting to wade into the water with other people or to teach them or to try to swim with them. And, you know, when you're both, I, I mean, nowadays I desire to swim with people who aren't thrashing that we can swim together in unison. And, and I, I find really deep satisfaction in, uh, in doing that with people and, and swim and living that way with people, as opposed to constant conflict and, and toxicity and challenge. I mean, there's a time and a place for that for sure, but Sometimes you just want to get up first thing in the morning and go for a good swim. And, and if you meet somebody on the way, great. Hey, have a, you know, how are you doing? Great day. You won't even say anything. You're just going to swim in unison. And that's the, that's the word shared between two people. There's nothing need to be said, needs to be said. And a lot of coal, a lot of Hanshan's poetry is like that. When you're calm and you're quiet and still, they really take on a resonance. They have a resonance that is, it's like a gong that's just like, it doesn't stop. It just gets louder and louder and louder and louder. Hmm. All right. So with all that nonsense out of the way, um, page 39 of Rip Rap by Gary Snyder. Hanshan's, this is one of Hanshan's 300 poems. The path to Hanshan's place is laughable. A path, but no sign or, of cart or horse. Converging gorges, hard to trace their twists. Jumble cliffs, unbelievably rugged. A thousand grasses bend with dew. A hill of pines hums in the wind. And now I've lost the shortcut home. Body asking shadow, how do you keep up? The shadow's just there. It doesn't need to keep up. Two. In a tangle of cliffs, I chose a place. Bird paths, but no trails for men. What's beyond the yard? White clouds clinging to vague rocks. Now I've lived here. How many years? Again and again, spring and winter pass. Go tell families with silverware and cars. What's the use of all that noise and money? And you can see there, you know, there's a translation of cars. And I would have liked to, them. I, I don't know, this is one problem I have with some of these translations. They trying to modernize things. And I think that makes it more relatable and for sure. But sometimes like maybe I'd like to see the, the clearest definite, you know, translation and then maybe a modern version of it just to compare. But um Obviously, cars was not what he said. <laughs> anyway, what's the use of all that noise and money? What's the use of all that noise and money? Can you imagine being so scared of the earth and scared of other beings that you want to leave the planet and you think that our hope is on another planet? Two's better than one. From my passive perspective, that seems like su such a waste of energy and resources. Ah, but we can mine meteors and can become a space-faring people in case something terrible happens on Earth. We will persist. Why should we persist? What is this drive to leave a mark in a universe that science says will be gone in, a, in billions of years? Our image of the world is just a clock that runs down. I think we're seeing more and more that that's not accurate. The James Webb Telescope has been launched and, and has been, and it's, it's viewing out into the universe farther than we've ever looked before. And oh, just in a few years, it's shown us so much and shown the ignorance of our old thinking and positions. For instance, the Big Bang is. I think pretty much, uh, you know, an idea that's come and gone and, and the universe, it seems there was no bang the way that it's moving. And, and, uh, it leads them to think that there was no bang. It was always here potentially. And some physicists have said the universe is forever. It just, it contracts and expands our idea that the universe would either have to always be expanding out or crunching back in, which we thought at different times. Um, I mean, these are hypotheses. So there's nothing in science that's settled. There's hypotheses that are backed up by observations, by 
persistent and repeatable observations and experiments. So, you know, our mind should always be, op be open to change. Some use it as gospel and make a book out of it. A holy book. These are, this is the way that things are. This is, this is how it is. And, and uh, is that any different than the religious, you know, with their stories, um, creation, um, their imaginal stories of creation, mythological, myth, mythological views, some who take it very seriously <laughs> and literally, <laughs> I think, uh, I think the scientific approach is the better way. Test, verify, experiment. I think this is a good way to live that will keep opposed to giving yourself to just opinion and fan fantasies. I think grounding yourself and your life and where you are and the world you live in and that what's truth is anything that accords most, most closely to how things actually are. I think these are, these are good ways to live our lives. Three, in the mountains, it's cold, always been cold, not just this year. Jagged scarps forever snowed in, woods in the dark ravines, spitting mist. Grass is still sprouting at the end of June. Leaves begin to fall in early August. And here I am, high on mountains, peering and peering, but I can't even see the sky. Five. I wanted a good place to settle. Cold mountain would be safe. Light wind and hidden pine. Listen close, the sound gets better. Under it, a gray-haired man mumbles along, reading Huang and Lao. For ten years, I haven't gone back home. I've even forgotten the way by which I came. I recently came across a, um, a story uh, or the life of a uh, Orthodox monk who was a student of Alan Watts back in the 50s and 60s in California. And he just had such an urgency to find what he wanted, to find the truth. He left the world behind. He went into, created his own hermitage, joined the Orthodox Church, became a monk, started his own pilgrimage and hermitage, and, and uh, he, he died young of, uh, or fairly middle age, I guess, of, uh, up there. And, uh, and, he's been, and he's become a saint, you know, in the Orthodox Church, I believe, at least a, an American one. I understand that. And I think, I don't think that I would ever want to live that way all the time. I think taking time to step away and center yourself and, and remind yourself of who you are and, and, and what nature is. And I think it's, uh, spending some time just doing manual labor and living your day to day life. And, uh, I mean, that's a, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, I think, I think we can live our li our normal lives that way, but it's it's so difficult to to find stillness in our in our in our in our world. I think, but go into the backyard, sit down, grow a garden, if you have the opportunity. I like this one. Thirteen. I can't stand these bird songs. Now I'll go rest in my straw shack. The cherry flowers are out scarlet. The willow shoots up feathery. Morning sun drives over blue peaks. Bright clouds wash green ponds. Who knows that I'm out of the dusty world, climbing the southern slope of Cold Mountain. And here we are, reading the words, hundreds and hundreds of years later. Fifteen. There's a naked bug at Cold Mountain, with a white body and a black head. His hand holds two book scrolls, one the way and one its power. His shack's got no pots or ovens, he goes for a walk with his shirt and pants askew, but he always carries the sword of wisdom. He means to cut down senseless craving. He's that naked bug, right? He's the naked bug. 17. If I hide out at Cold Mountain, living off mountain plants and berries all my lifetime, why worry? One follows his karma through. Days and months slip by like water. Time is like sparks knocked off flint. Go ahead and let the world change. I'm happy to sit among the cliffs. I think life's more interesting and beautiful when you don't hide. When you walk in the world as you are. 20. Hanshan had his critics. <laughs> um, so this is a good one. 20. 
Some critic tried to put me down. Your poems lack the basic truth of Tao. And I recall the old timers who were poor and didn't care. I have to laugh at him. He misses the point entirely. Men like that ought to stick to making money. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you know, someone will come up to you and say, yeah, your words are shit. Your writing sucks. You suck. You don't understand. You're, you're nobody. Yeah, they'd like you to believe that because they're in the world um, and they think that uh, the way they're living is, is the best way to live. And, and they cannot see through your eyes. They cannot see through your eyes or your life. They don't even try. They're just going to tell you, no, your words are shit. And there's kind of a fun way to deal with that. If you are coming from a place, I think, of, of Tao, of stillness, of, of flow, of existence, you know, you can just laugh and say, okay, <laughs> thank you for your opinion, nod, and you walk on. That's the way you really have to be, I think. I mean, to deal with a lot of the, when you start to express yourself, you know, and the reactions of others, hold your line. You have to hold, you have to hold your line. Well, that's all I want to talk about right now. Thanks for stopping by. Adieu.